congrats on the book launch, by the way. Not your first book, but still a big deal. Yeah, I'm very happy with this particular book. I'm proud of it. I love it. And the thing is, is because the program in it, the system in it, that's not invented by me. So you don't have to worry. Because <laughs> I'm potentially an idiot. I could come up with all sorts of mad ideas. Right. But the program is... Uh, it endures. The program is like a hundred years old. The twelve-step program, primarily invented to help people with serious chemical dependency issues in your country, America, a hundred years ago, nearly. I think the principles within it are applicable to all forms of attachment, and I think that it can be nothing less in the right context than a kind of secular religion. Most people that get involved with twelve-step programs go, "Oh, wow! Everyone should be doing this." This is because, like, of course, once you yourself have got rid of drugs and alcohol one day at a time, you start to realise that drugs and alcohol were never the problem. The problem was your own emotional mm -hmm. state, your own reaction to the world. So the, you have to start working on them. And the 12 Steps works on them. In fact, that's the function of it. The first thing you do, if, you, if you're with drugs or alcohol or food, you stop taking drugs. You know, if it's food, you have a structured way of doing it. Then you start following these steps, and it's about inventory in yourself. It's about treating people differently. It's a complete tool for transition. It sounds like a self-help program that you only get to when you have seriously run out of options, which is a problem, because it seems yeah. like you should be working on that stuff before you run into the problems themselves. That's exactly right. It's like that I wouldn't have done a 12-step program were it not for the fact that I was on the precipice of serious mental health and criminal judicial yeah. issues. But like the like, but the problems that I had prior to becoming a drug addict were continual. Like the way that I related to food, the way that I related and used TV it was all problematic, and and that's exactly it. Why wait for crisis? Or like your life may not provide you with crisis. You might be someone that's just coping, being in crap jobs, crap relationships, not really happy. It takes as its premise the quite simple notion that you deserve to be happy inverted commas, content, free from pain, free from suffering, which I suppose, again, is the foundational point of all religions. Like, right, you're here, you're sure. going to die. Do you want a, some sort of system, or are you going to just try and cope with it through masturbation and right. buying stuff? Oh, I'll try masturbation and buying stuff. All right, see you with a deathbed. You know, like, the reason the book starts with talking about death is because of the, one of the sort of um, visceral things that I feel is that a lot of people you meet in the world, and like even people in my own family, I think, when is it that you're going to be who you actually are? I know people that I feel that when they are on their deathbed, they're going to go, oh, this isn't who I was, ah, bye! Yeah. Right, you right. Know, like, they're, what, they're clinging After on. After all that. Yeah. What, like, so this is, in a way, a sort of an awakening tool, I guess, or an awakening system or code. But as you said, Jordan, most people don't engage with it until crises. Why do you think that is? I mean, we're, when you were growing up, when you were looking at this, uh, the problems that you were, I guess, experiencing, why did you look to one, why do you think people look to one thing and not the other? Why do you think people look to substances instead of working on, on the problem in a way that's, is it because it's harder? Is that it? Is, is it that simple? My personal theory is that it's to do with our way of life. Like, they are, the, the, that we live in a, a system that tells you you can make yourself feel better by getting stuff, by buying stuff, by doing stuff. And there is almost no way that is presented to you in ordinary and realistic terms to deal with your inner life. Why do people drink? I'm not even talking about people who drink problems. Anybody. They drink because they want to feel good. They want to go out on a Friday or a Saturday and feel good. Well, there should be other ways of feeling good. Feeling good shouldn't be something that needs to be facilitated by an external agent. It should be something that you have an ongoing relationship with. The reason I think the world is like it is because I feel that we have quite a deep and all-encompassing capitalist consumer system and we can't see the edges of it. We are all within it. We think about life in those terms. You think about life as a commodity. Is it worth doing it? Look at the buying the bees that we were talking about already. You have the bees in order to get the honey. The, the idea of just have the bees that's not you're not commodifying it we autumn we default to commodification so i think that creates a mindset in us that we are looking to consume always looking to acquire and these are not original ideas so they're relatively like i suppose when uh, 
what's his name, Guy Debord, the French situationist, says that, that we live in a spectacle. We are, we are losing our contact with reality. We are living in an externalized way. That when you're at work, you're, you're in, engaged in your profession or whatever your job is. And when you get home, you're a consumer. Sit and watch that TV, buy stuff. And now people carry their advertising devices in the palm of their hand. Thank God they do, because we work in a form of media, which right, means yeah. that that's bloody useful to us. It's not all bad, but for but a lot of people, I think the reason that we have excessive drug addiction, excessive alcoholism, food issues is because people are constantly reaching for something external that's already in them. And do you think it's that people don't know how to get that out of themselves or they don't know that it's there at all? They don't. I think that all of us, as an addict, I feel like it's a, the drive is slightly stronger. The, the, I think a, a person that develops chemical dependency issues develops them because they are not happy. They're like, oh no, is this life? I'm going to die. I'm expected to, this is school, is it? What, this is family life? Well, this isn't going to work. You better give me something else. Mm -hmm. And because the world tells you, well, it's going to be outside of you, and no one tells you, like, you know, no one's giving you ideas on prayer, meditation, solitude, serenity, excuse yeah. that noise, maybe yeah. Charlie will grab that. Like the, then you, you look to resolve it using some external agent or method. And like, I think that, that these like people that are in recovery groups have found a different way of dealing with their feelings. It seems like this started pretty early for you. I had a question before, how do you get addicted to eBay? But I assume it was just like, every day looking for something new on eBay? What, why eBay and not Amazon, for example? I've never personally had those kind of addictions because oh, of okay. like, uh, more of me would be social media, say, like tech stuff. Like, and what I mean is, I think addiction is something that you do a lot, it's not good for you, you don't want to do it, and you can't stop. Compulsion. So, yeah, compulsion and obsession, I think, are two of the ingredients of addiction. Now, if your obsession and compulsion is about a substance, it gets bad fast. And if it's about behaviour, you can carry it on longer. So no, I don't have, like I put on there sort of social media and stuff because I do notice that I stare at my phone a lot and I often don't feel better after looking at Twitter for ages. So just Twitter will definitely not make you feel better. That's <laughs> out of all of the social media, Twitter will make you feel the worst, the quickest, because it seems so anonymous and so easy. And so it's quick. It's kind of like every time you go out there, you get those little jabs. Mm. Whereas... On Instagram, you know, you're looking at them, they're looking at you. Most of the profiles aren't anonymous on Facebook, for example. So Twitter is just like, for me, that's it's useful and yet a cesspool at the same time. Oh, it's a useful cesspool. It's a bear pit. It, yeah, a bear pit, yeah. Do you find yourself still using social... Like, is there any healthy balance for you? Social media is good, but I have to cap myself at half an hour, or are you just like, I can't look at this at all anymore? I think, like, with the chemical dependency, abstinence is... The, of what I believe in. If you're a drug addict, you cannot take drugs one day at a time. If you're an alcoholic, can't take drugs. Food, gambling, and gambling, I think you can't gamble. But like food and sex, food, these are life giving things. They're natural things. We have to find a structured way. And I would say that social media belongs in that category. Uh, so, what, so, so, me personally, I don't anymore have my Twitter password someone that I work with does that, so I'll go, here's a photograph and a thing, and maybe once in a while they'll tell me some stuff that's going on on there. Or with Facebook, I've never had it, so I don't know how to, I can look at my Facebook page, but I can't go in it, or, do, you know what I mean? So, and with Instagram, I post stuff, but because I, I, otherwise, I, I'm a sensitive person, and I'll get too affected by it, even sure. negatively or positively. I would say, if you can have, if you, like one thing, you say you went, right, I'm only going to use social media for half an hour a day, between 4.30 and 5, that's when I look at social media. And then if you try and do it and you can't, it's like, well, there you go. You've learned something about yourself. You aren't capable of keeping it to half an hour. So that tells you you're not in control of it anymore. So that's, you know, in a way, step one, you've got to then admit you've got a problem with social media. It seems tough to admit you're addicted to something because it's obvious when it's cocaine. It's obvious mm. when it's alcohol. Maybe not for a lot of folks, but it can be. But when it's computers, social media, or shopping, it's really easy to couch, or sex, it's easy to couch that in something else, especially for somebody who is well-known to the world to, use, to, to realize they're addicted to sex and not just having fun. Do you remember that process? Because at some point you must have been like, this is awesome. Every woman that I fancy, I can go after and get. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And then at some point, you must have gone, actually, this is really bad for my emotional well-being. I was aware that it was probably... Like, I'm quite... God, 
Addiction is a bit of a blind spot for me, sort of oddly, because I sometimes think I'm clever, but then I, sometimes it's revealed to me that I'm not because my behaviour is so dumb, you know. But like, so with sex, it's interesting because I feel like, well, I'm an adult, I'm attracted to adults, in my case of the opposite sex, adult human females, it's all pretty vanilla and innocuous. Yeah. And like when I first got famous, it was like, I felt like I was addressing the uh, the previous circumstance of not feeling good enough, not feeling attractive, trying to address that. It was so exciting and felt kind of validating. And of course, sex is fun anyway. I mean, that's the point of it. And and um, so it, it does take a while. The only time, I suppose, you know, using the model that I've just said, you're doing it, it becomes problematic, you can't stop it. Well, it becomes problematic when you think, oh, I might like to be in a relationship with one person now. And you try and then you sort of can't because one I think people that have a lot of sex with strangers often find intimacy with one person challenging uh, that, that's certainly true in my case is it because of you're spreading it out thin instead of going deep yeah well, yeah that's a really simple way to put it I think it is that and I think that it, it like intimacy with a stranger for most people I know that have had issues around sex intimacy with a stranger is kind of lovely you don't know them and then you have that sudden excitement of sex and you're kind of connected to them in that context and it's not with you know I used to joke about it I used to say it's because like I can have sex with a stranger because I'm not thinking about any other information in that person's life I'm not thinking oh no her brother's got diabetes <laughs> oh she might be worried about this what if that happened no yeah. they're just, they only exist in that context in a way there's something spiritual about it you're in the moment there's no judgement the connection is very pure it's in the, the type of stuff that I was into at least and then but like after a while I think that that means that when you do know somebody it seems almost absurd to sort of be intimate with them and the kind of physical proximity and the the frequency of sex I've had to learn, like you know like a lot of people my age and god knows what it's like if you're younger pornography is what I learned sex from I didn't know one yeah. taught me all right this is what it is to be a man and if you're into women this is what women are like or if you're into men this is what men are like and this is how we treat each other and this is what it should feel like and this is how to be loving I was just like yeah I'll look at these magazines yeah. look at these videos and it was about I don't know you know what pornography is so sure. it's not a very good template really that problem must be so much worse now I think about this probably more than I need to but when you and I were kids you had to find the you had to find a kid who had the magazines, mm. and you might have been the kid who had the magazines. I, I was, I had a neighbor who had those, uh -huh. and then maybe when I was fourteen or something or twelve, one guy had a tape that he had stolen from his uncle or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. But nobody, you had to wait, and your mom's not home, and you know she's going to be gone for two hours, and your buddy comes over, and he's ready to, you know. There's a lookout and everything. Now, your, your kid could be in the back seat of the car with you while you're driving, and he could be on Pornhub, and you would have no idea. It's unbelievable. Yeah. The same is kind of true with drugs. You can now, like, you know, with, like, what's called spice in my country, those ever-evolving sort of smokable oh, yeah. drugs. Like, you know... Bath they, salts, I think we call them. Bath right? salts, that's right, in your country. You can just, like, you know, you can buy them online. Your kid could be using drugs. So, like, the way that we treat addiction has got to change because addiction is changing because, like you say, your kid could be in the back of your car looking at a porn hub or ordering online drugs and unless they have access to a way of addressing that and the feelings that are motivating them towards that because, yeah, Mike can experience of porn was similar but looking back I recognised I was just trying to make myself feel better of course it's natural to for your when your sexuality is awakening you're looking to express it yeah. but is it the correct way to be looking at images again and again you're, you're starting off on the path of your sexuality regarding the people that you'll be having sex with as an object yeah. as the beginning of objectification is happening right there so uh, for me and I was doing it a lot to make myself feel better as well. I was like, oh, this makes me feel good. It's a distraction. I'm not in myself when I'm doing this. And you're right. It's terrifying, the idea of the access to pornography that kids will have now. It seems like when you're, when you, for example, with sex, drugs and things like that, people might say, hey, man, look, you, you ever think about you're doing too much of this? Guys don't get that with sex, mm -hmm. right? Your friends never go, look, man, you're having too much sex. We need to tone it down people yeah. are going you're the you're my hero yeah that's right and i used to I notice that a lot of how i would relate to men was about like i felt powerful among men because yeah. other men knew that i would sleep with a lot of women now uh, what i have since learned is that a necessary component of that was that i was not respecting what it was like for the people i was having sex with even though of course they were people that were 
I mean, what's so amazing about being famous is people that are willing and excited and up for it, and there's a constant flow, and it's sort of unbelievable in yeah, one respect. It sounds pretty good right now. You're, it I does mean. sound good when I'm saying it again. But the problem is, of course, that now I know, now that I'm awakened, that uh, one moment at a time, that these are human beings and once you realize oh they're probably doing that for their they've got their own motivation yeah. because they're not going to feel any better for having sex with a famous person except for the brief moment of orgasm which i did used to try to guarantee jordan <laughs> uh, like uh, other than that you, you know you're involving yourself in an exchange that isn't necessarily going to be beneficial so yeah. i'm participating in other people's unconscious behavior and for myself it means I'm like, what lies on the other side of addiction? That's what's interesting. What lies on the other side of the compulsion? See this, when you want to look at social media and you don't, what happens to you? You start to get anxious. You start to get nervous. You want to have sex with someone and you don't. What happens? You start to get nervous. You start to get anxious. Well, you have to go through that pain at some point because if you live constantly confined by your unwillingness to go through pain, you do not develop into who you are supposed to be. You know, like, I, I lived in that cycle, and then when I couldn't, it, it meant I became kind of stagnant spiritually. So if you mean that you have to go through that, that cycle of pain in order to get through the addiction, did the addiction, this sounds dumb now that I'm verbalizing it, but did then the addiction start because of pain? Yes. Addiction, this isn't really, not dumb, it's the most, perhaps the most important observation that can be made about addiction, is that addiction begins with pain and ends with pain. You're in pain, you introduce some secondary agent to deal with the pain, then that might even make you feel worse, so you're back in pain and you do it again. It's very obvious when it's drugs, it's less obvious when it's pornography. People feel ashamed. If someone's trying to be faithful in a relationship and they sleep with other people outside the relationship, they feel ashamed when they do it. And then the feeling of shame is so bad, and they, you know, it's not always the right thing to tell the other person. They, they get to the worse, they do it again. Food, it's the same process. People, you feel awful, you're in pain, you feel lonely, you eat too much food, you make yourself puke, you feel ashamed, you do it again. At some point this cycle has to be broken. This is one of the things I found myself saying, and I think it's pretty true, Jordan, that we don't choose between having a program and not having a program. We choose between a conscious program and an unconscious program. Mm -hmm. We're working a program. I've got a program already. My program is I want drugs, I want sex, I want people to like me, I want money, I want prestige. And if I don't intervene with that, like a sort of a waterfall, it just rushes away. So I ha this program makes me awaken. Right? One, it, there's a problem, whether it's drugs, sex, porn, food, relationships, whatever. One, there's a problem. Two, it's possible that it could be better because I see other people not living like it, other people that work the program. Three, I'm get, I become willing to be teachable. I become willing to look at things in a different way. I become willing to accept help, whether it's from a community or from a higher power, a, a spiritual idea there. You mentioned that prestige was one of the things that you felt like, and pardon me if I'm putting words in your mouth, you were addicted to prestige as well. How does that fit in with your career now? Because you can't not have prestige and do the job that you're doing, but you have to then sort of short circuit the addiction part of the prestige. Part thing. of how it is complex, Jordan, and like, so, like, but it, the, the method and that perspective of addiction that I have is that addiction as a drive, if you drill, drill down, this thing is a, a will to power, whether you call it obsession, compulsion, whatever it is, it's like it's a yearning, a hunger. What does it want? What does it want, this hunger? Now, once I'm awakened, I become, I'm sort of, I can watch it a little bit more, do you see? So it doesn't mean, right, I'm, for me, I'm not going to become a yogi or a monk or someone that lives in a cave and meditates all day. That's not, I don't think, my path. I'm going to be involved with the material world. I have a wife, I have a baby, I've got bees, damn it. Yeah, you yeah. got bees. There's no going back. No. You, can't, you can't abandon the bees. You can't unbe yourself. No. Yeah, but like, but you're right. What it changes is that I notice, oh, like when I'm doing this podcast right now in this moment, I'm thinking, oh, I hope this goes well. I hope this will be the best one of the podcasts that uh, Jordan has ever done. So far, so good. And it will get the best figures. And like now when I see myself thinking that, I just sort of go, that. Oh, you know, that's just that habit you have in your mind. Don't take it too seriously. Your thoughts become the first layer of the outside world. Your cognitive activity, your thoughts, 
no longer define you. You start to recognise it as just a pattern in your mind. Oh, I always think stuff like that. Don't worry about it too much. And I go, oh no, I'm so shallow. I want to, I want everyone to love me. I just go, oh, yeah, that's just a habit you picked up somewhere. That you aren't. I have tried to be the experiencer, the consciousness that watches those patterns. And when you have undergone this programme, that perspective becomes easier to access. It is by no means permanent. That's why you get people that get to the top of the mountain, priests, yogis, swamis, and then you find out they're all having sex with the people in their communes. You're like, oh, all <laughs> yeah. right, okay, I trusted you. It happens not just in Christian culture, it happens in like, you know, sort of in far out places where sure. Western people like me really think, oh no, they've got the answer, yeah. their robes with shaved heads, so and you find out they're doing the same thing. Unless you stay moment to moment vigilant about your patterns, they will reassert. That has to be kind of scary to know that as much work as you've done to get through addiction, you're 15 years almost clean, right? Yes. That if you let your guard down, you could be back to square one. Is that not intimidating a little bit? It seems like that would be scary for me. Because it's like you keep walking away from the cliff edge, and then you turn right just to check and see how far away you are, and you realize you've just been walking along the cliff edge for 15 years. It's a good metaphor. Thanks. Well, yeah, but we are all walking along the cliff edge. In a way, the addiction just makes you address it. All in a all of us are just one decision away from destroying our lives, really. You can, in traffic, get in a fight with someone, you punch them, they hit their head, they die, that's your life now. Oh, man. <laughs> or, like, you cheat on your wife because someone is nice to you and you feel vulnerable in that moment, or you take drugs and you overdose. You know, you're never... Um, you know, it can happen. So... And all of these, but I think you can guard against these things by having a kind of a spiritual awakening, by being connected. Look, in the terms of the program, like, one, are you a bit fucked? Yes. Two, could you not be fucked? Yeah, I see people that are not fucked all the time, so I could be like them. Three, are you on your own going to unfuck yourself? No, because I, I, whatever the answer is, it ain't in my head, because if it was, I'd have found it by now. Right. But all I've done my whole life is tried to be happy. It's not working. I need help. Four, this is where it gets practical. Write down all the things that are fucking you up or have ever fucked you up. Don't lie or leave anything out. So you make a thorough inventory in this particular technique for doing that. Five, honestly tell someone trustworthy about how fucked you are. So you, then you start involving other people. Now, when I'd done that, it taught me that I didn't need to be so ashamed of myself. But all of the dark, dirty little secrets that I carried... The guy that I told was like, yeah, that's no big deal, I did something like that. You know, some level, I think we all think we're unlovable, we wake up at 3am, oh no, I'm worthless, I'm crap, I'm not good enough, I'm a piece of shit. Well, like, that's not real. It's just a sort of a pattern that you're carrying. And by telling someone else, it's a, it's, it alleviates you. Most traditions have confession in them. Six, well, that's a lot of fucked up patterns, do you want to stop it seriously? You know, you observe, oh yeah, I, like when I did the inventory, it made me realise, uh, the way I got in trouble at school is the same way I got in trouble at MTV. The way I got in trouble in Hollywood, same way I got in trouble in politics. I all, I have a pattern, I get into a place, I get loads of attention, and then I do something mad. I've always done it. So like, and I do it because of pride, self-centeredness, aspects of my ego. Am I, then the step, seventh step, right now you know that, are you willing to live in a new way that's not all about you and your previous fucked up stuff? You have to. It's like, well, okay, am I willing to not do that? Now, think of the thing we're talking about, lust, you know, the pornography. When it, it's easy in this room to think about that, if I'm on my own late at night, mm, the feeling comes, oh, maybe I will look at pornography. Am I in that moment willing to take a different course of action? Am I willing to call up someone else, go, yeah, listen, I'm in this moment thinking about, one, using drugs, two, cheating on my wife, three, pornography, four, eating food and making myself puke, five, texting that guy that I know is no good for me. You know, like, if you're prepared to make the phone call, before you do it, the person will go, okay, well, remember, we've done all these steps, we've done all this inventory, we know where this leads. Are you going to do it, yes or no? And that sometimes gives you respite. That's why you work it one day at a time, one moment at a time, because it will always come back. You are always walking along the cliff edge. I like that analogy. A, once you've done this process, you realise you've hurt a lot of people in your life. Prepare to apologise to everyone for everything affected by you being so fucked up. So you, you prepare to apologise. You just go, well, you write down all the people you might have harmed. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. That's got to be a sobering, pardon the pun, list of people. Because you're... It can't be a short list. No, I'm old. You know, like, it's loads of people. And like, so, like, oh, and a lot of those people, you, you know what you do? You go, yeah, but they did this. Yeah. And that, you're not allowed to do that. You have to go, never mind what they did. What did you do? And mm -hmm. you just put down your stuff. 
and like you completely eliminate e.g. like my stepdad if I think oh my stepdad he like I wasn't I weren't very nice to him when I was a kid but my next thought is yeah but I was just a kid he's an adult I don't yeah. know that, like, he like, should have known better <laughs> yeah. yeah but that's not going to help me change going he should have known better that's where I am already I need to change my perspective and to change my perspective I have to go forget what he did I did something wrong. Um, and then the next step, now apologise, and that's that would make things worse. So I get myself into a frame of mind where I'm become willing to go without any of the parentheses or caveats, go, why I behaved when you were with my mum, it was not acceptable. I apologise for that. It must have hurt you. It must have been very difficult for you. I'm not that man anymore. I don't live like that and I don't treat people that way anymore. I apologise. Is there anything else that I did that you want to tell me about? And if there's anything I can do to make amends, I'll do it. Right, you become like, and once you do that, it's sort of your consciousness has changed. You've yeah. hacked into your patterns. You can't do that all at once, though, because if you right, because if you apologize to people and say, "Is there anything else you want to go back and forth?" There's probably a lot of people that go, "You know what? Now that you mention it, mm. there's a whole lot of stuff you did when we lived together, while I was raising you, during your college years, blah blah blah, when we were married." And you, you, you got to be taking some uh, not abuse, maybe, but or maybe abuse from some of these people whether you deserve it or not. You go into it consciously and you don't go into it alone. You go into it, you know, that's the, the ninth step for a reason. You've already done these previous eight steps. You're already a different guy by the time you get to that point. And also, importantly, you do it under the guidance of a mentor. So one by one, you go to the mentor, right, I'm doing the one with the stepdad now. Okay, so what are your expectations? How do you see it going? What are you going to say? What are you going to say when he says this? So and like, an important part of it, and in fact the best part of it, is the bit where they go, you don't know this, but when you did that, it made me feel this. And you just have to sit there while someone tells you, and you think, oh my God, my actions really hurt other people. And the reason it's called an amends process is not just restitution and apology to the other person, because it amends you. You think, I'm not doing that ever again. I don't ever want to hurt someone the way I've hurt that person. People that just will be like extras in your life, people that you just pass by in a crowd scene. Right. You think, oh my God, I damaged them. So now when I'm walking down a corridor, uh, Access Hollywood or wherever we happen to be, we could be in any number of places. <laughs> That's right. It could have been that. I could have just chosen that off the top of my head. When I walk down a corridor, I don't, like, I'm polite to everyone. <laughs> I'm polite. Like, and I don't, like, I want it, no one coming away going, he's dick, that guy. Yeah. I don't, can't take no more of it. It's, it's a lot of responsibility especially for somebody who's in the spotlight but what the choice do we have Jordan you know like the, the, that's the realization that you come to and that there isn't another like it's almost you're not giving anything up because none of that stuff works anyway it's not like yeah but oh no now I can't be an arsehole anymore <laughs> like being an arsehole wasn't working anyway otherwise right. I'd have carried on doing it having sex with everyone weren't working be, like being obsessed with fame and money it wasn't working so you're not giving up anything real every so often of course you are seduced again like look this is what's important here, it, it, what's, um, what I'm trying to do, which I think is a bit hard, is that I think there's a lot of stuff in religion that has been sort of booted out in the secular age because we all know the complications with religious life, the violence, the bigotry, the institutionalisation, right. etc. But in religion there are stories that are about the human psyche and the human condition that are indispensable. E.g., we're talking about what we're talking about now, of, oh, it's a tough gig, this... Like, well, look at the myth of the Egyptian sun god, Ra, who nightly wrestles with the serpent of darkness so that the dawn may come, knowing that the next day he will undertake the same battle again. I mean, of course, that helps, you know, primitive, I mean, not primitive, they built the pyramids, but like, you know, early people to have some relationship with astronomy and astrology and all that. But it also helps you to understand this is life. The every day, Sisyphus, who daily pushes the rocks to the top of the mountain, knowing that tomorrow he does it again. Prometheus, who has his guts pecked out by the eagle for stealing fire and giving light to mankind, knows that the next day his stomach's going to heal and the eagle's going to peck it out again. This is it. Accept it. Life is, there is suffering in life. We're going to die. So the choices are, are you going to be beautiful while you're here or are you going to make stuff worse? Now, the problem I think we have is the culture not individuals anymore, but of course individuals, but more importantly the culture is saying we are going to make it as bad as possible. Yeah. We're going to exemplify and constitutionalize the worst aspects of human nature. Greed, selfishness, these are going to be our politics now. These are our, I'm not even talking about recent events, although obviously yes, but capitalism generally, materialism generally. 
an age of darkness, an age where we only understand what's gross because we've forgotten how to go within. And like this simple program for dealing with yourself means that I, as just one little unit within it, am doing my best. With the severe and underscored caveat, I'm still a total fuck up and I still every day will do stuff that's selfish and make mistakes and be impatient with my wife and make mistakes with my kid. But the guiding light is I'm trying to be good. I'm not just going, yeah, but that's life. Who gives a shit? So what? It doesn't really matter, does it? So what? Yeah, it was my wife's lucky to have me. Who cares if I sleep with some other people? Once? <laughs> you know what I mean? I can go that way. If I, like all of us, we can all go that way. We're all comprised of, you know, good and evil. So... But this is it's just it's a commitment, an intention, a program, a method. Speaking of wrestling with good and evil, you've been a vegetarian since you were 14, so at one point in your life, there was accident as your vegetable juice you. arrives on cue. Jung um, would say that that was a sign that we are communing the subjective inner world and the objective outer world are communing and aligning. Jung would say. I like that it's not a plastic straw, too. That's, oh, God, that it's is a, a nice paper touch, straw. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's uh, that cup's probably made out of like the corn plastic. I hope. Yeah, but, no, this is from look certified composite. Oh, yeah, made from corn. There you go. I'm a great guy. I keep these. <laughs> so you were a vegetarian since you were 14. That means then, at one point in your life, you were not willing to eat meat, but you were willing to like do crack or something. That's right. How that was an interesting that stage. Go. How does that work? What was going on there? Some of it's about identity, I think. Yeah. Like the, I was a fan of the Smiths, and I just I I found it impossible not to translate my sort of love of animals on a kind of oh that dog yeah. like I found it impossible to not translate that to I shouldn't eat that animal over there should I yeah. like, it became sort of repulsive mentally and a nice commitment and for me you know drugs although you're a pain in the ass to other people it's pretty it's a self-destructive thing you're trying to annihilate the self you're trying to get beyond the self so it's yourself you're harming really so the vegetarianism I'm, I must admit there were probably late night relapses at burger vans out of my mind on something or another where I erred from that path but I see the paradox of being like a vegetarian crackhead <laughs> <laughs> yeah it just seems so so unusual, but I think it makes sense with your earlier, I don't know, parable is the right word, with the constant battle that's going on. It seems like almost like there's an element of, all right, well, I can't control this area of my life, so maybe I can try to control this other area and be strict enough with it. And also the addiction is a little bit about control, you yeah. know, because it's, you can control it, you can get heroin, you can get crack, you can alter your state of mind much harder to control another human being impossible ultimately yeah. so I think it's about my what I liked about being a drug addict is you're just on your own I wasn't very sociable just on your own doing drugs shutting down all nice and comfortable and all of the pain melting away and the tight fist in my belly opening up problem was is in the end it stopped working and it got worse and it created worse problems so I needed to find another way of alleviating that tension and thankfully I found it in that in that program so I think addiction is a sort of way of finding control finding meaning finding order finding connection in a culture that doesn't provide it doesn't know how to provide it because it's too busy turning you into a component in an economic machine why write this book now after being clean for 15 years you know why not write it earlier what sparked the interest suddenly in this because it's not like you just recovered and you're like i'm gonna write a book on this and mm. you've done you've gone through this process for as long as the us the public has really known you because i think at this point i understand it and i understand it well enough to know how little i understand it i'm at a point where i can say whilst i've written this book anybody that's got clean time could have written a book. I still like. I still have to spend and enjoy and love spending time with other recovering addicts and recovering alcoholics and people with issues around all manner of um, compulsions. And when I go and spend time with them, like I'm not like sat in the middle, like with a blanket draped dra around me and dramatically lit. I'm just <laughs> another one of them. And it's a relief to be another one of them. And it's a relief to know that I'm still, like you say, on the cliff edge and that I could fall over at any moment. I'm not better than anybody else. I don't have that illusion. I lost that now. 
sometimes I can be a bit grand and a show off, but I know that I'm no better than anyone else. But the relief is I know I'm no worse than anybody else. I'm just a normal person. You seen that film Punch Drunk Love, the Sandler a movie? A long time ago, yeah. There's a bit in it, right, where after he confronts Philip Seymour Hoffman, who's been bullying yeah. him on the phone, like after he's been real meek and he's been easily bullied, there's a bit where he just goes, like, you know, he confronts him finally and goes, I'm a nice person. I'm a nice person. And the reason that it's sort of beautiful and moving is because he's not saying I'm great or I'm powerful or I'm wonderful or I'm invincible. Just saying I'm a nice person. It's such a simple little aspiration. I'm a nice person to so just be a nice person in the world. So I suppose if I'd have written this a while ago, there'd have been much more I'm the new Jesus about it. <laughs> now, yeah. I'm always attracted to being the new Jesus. Why not? I mean, part of the point of Jesus was saying, that there is a consciousness accessible to all of us that is within us. The kingdom of heaven is within. The way to God is through I. The way to God is through the self. It's about the God made flesh. It was about God is within man. God is not in the constellations and the stars. God is in your belly. God is telling you, don't do that. That was wrong. So no one else is telling me, don't cheat. No one else is telling me, don't speak uh, badly to people if you don't think they can do anything for you. So my guts go, that was cruel what you just did. Like, well, who is that in there yeah. that's saying that Jiminy Cricket arsehole kicking me in the guts? So, you know, now it's written from a perspective of fallibility and ordinary real fallibility about the ordinary real aspiration that ordinary people can have, that we can all have together to be beautiful. How do you prioritize your different passions? On the one hand, you're a comedian, actor, public personality, you have thousands of people constantly interrupting you and trying to get your attention. But on the other hand, you're a creative, so you need to carve out massive amounts of time to be creative, create books, create great comedy. I would imagine that requires a lot of solitude. And these paths maybe appear to contradict, right? You, you have to be in the limelight, you have to be accessible, you have to be interacting with people, but you, you probably have to carve out a piece of your life to think deeply, otherwise you're just, you wouldn't be able to do it. It is contradictory, and it's changed since I've been married and had a baby. Before my whole life, even though I was clean from drugs for a long time, the behaviors, was carry, the behaviors were carrying on around sex, and the behaviors were carrying on around the obsession with the work itself, and, and the, <clears throat> the results of the work. Now, I have a wife and I have a daughter, and these are so compelling and so absorbing that you, it, like my baby and my wife are with me on this trip, so like when I'm in the hotel room, before there, maybe there would be a stylist and, you know, who would have been a good friend of mine, if it was, you know, on our hair and makeup, I also a good friend, so my life, the focus, the pinnacle of my life is the showing off in those times, now there's a baby, there's baby stuff everywhere, so you can't, <laughs> But be ordinary, it just grounds you and it smashes you or ego in, and your face actually sometimes yeah, in so many bloody ways, violent child. And, <laughs> uh, like, and, and, and I've sort of learned, uh, like, it's a very, in one way, a practical thing. Like I do stand up three nights a week back in the UK. I've written this book and I know that if I don't spend time at home, if I don't spend time around other addicts, I'll go all wrong, you know, I, so I've got no choice. And like the last three steps, funnily enough, are the maintenance steps. One, you just, we've done like the making amends and the things that we've already talked through. Ten, watch out for fucked up thinking and behavior and be honest when it happens. So if I'm out today and I start thinking, that's the point where it starts to be real. If I start thinking, oh, that person shouldn't have said that, or this should have done that, or that should have sold more, I go, ah, oh, that thing's happening happening again mm. right and so step 11 stay connected to your new perspective that's why i need prayer and meditation because part of my life is solitude it doesn't matter if this goes well or if this goes badly i'm going to be sitting down for half an hour with a candle in my case looking at a picture of amma the great hugging saint who travels from india and does nothing but raises money and helps people and sleeps on floor she's just like this unbelievable figure and i'm going to be you know like that will be part of my day and the prayer part of it, it reminds me of the principles that I want to live for by what I'm grateful for in my life and what, how I'm supposed to treat people. And number 12, and the point of all of this, curiously, look at life less selfishly, be nice to everyone, help people if you can. 
Like, so this whole journey deposits you in a place where you're trying to be of use to people. And again, every day I will default back to, hmm, should I buy this shirt or not? Do I look cool in this photo? I don't like that person said that. But it's not, I don't just accept it, justify it, pursue it. I remember, oh no, God, have you done anything for anyone else today? No, I've, all I've done all day is thought about myself. I'll go out and I'll try and help someone and be productive and constructive. And those things, that's changing you. I mean, I don't know much about neuroplasticity, you'll be surprised to learn. Yeah. Uh, apparently you change your consciousness alters as absolutely. you do these things yeah absolutely we talk about neuroplasticity all the time on the show do you? and essentially it's like drive it you know when you you see a road in a hot climate and it's got the the little dimples where the, all the cars drive yes it's a lot like that right so when it's hot and that asphalt heats up cars drive along essentially the same way or a hiking trail that is carved in a a grassy area. You can see it because people keep walking on it. That's essentially a very oversimplified way of how the brain works. So if you start different habits, you can start to create new neural pathways. The problem with things like addiction is that those old pathways that you've treaded for a decade and a half or whatever since you were 14 years old, those are still there. And you know that from experience, whether you know about neuroplasticity or not, because if somebody were to hold you down and force you to do a substance, you would those pathways would light up like crazy and you might have a hard time stopping mm. again. So now you've got your new habit, which is this green juice, and that's a more healthy habit to have. But as you know, any habit done to an extreme can result in something negative, right? You could end up surrounded by plastic cups or corn-made cups and have missed all of your appointments and haven't hung out with your family in three months because you got addicted to this green juice. I'm wallowing in kale in right. a bathtub. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going anywhere, bring me more kale. Yeah, that's exactly. It could easily happen. And like, one of the things about the spiritual life that is fascinating to me is the way that they somehow, thank you for explaining that so well, the way that they intuited information that we can now demonstrate materially and anatomically and sure. medically, they intuited that. So this system, of course it was the 12 steps which was only 100 years old, but it was taken from a Christian group, the Oxford group, which was older than that. And they and these principles are perennial and universal and they are found everywhere. Like with the mindfulness movement, they said, oh wow, if you meditate, you know, like it's good for your blood, it's good for your heart. Oh, is there anyone else that was saying that you should meditate like thousands of years ago mm -hmm. before scanning was available? Yeah, right. well, what else are those people saying? Because I think there might be other stuff in there. You know, it's obvious that there's a lot of stuff that's in religion that are, are the cultural inflections of the time that they were written. Bigoted, prejudicial information, practical stuff that doesn't seem relevant anymore. Sure. All of that. But this, the things that interest me are the things that are found in all religions. That's the stuff that we should be focusing on. If it's found in all of them, there's a kind of something that's coming out of the human consciousness that's truthful. And so now that it's found in the religion of our time, which I accept is you know, more science-based and empirical, and that's a bloody good thing and it's given us so much, but we should look to which of those principles were already present. And that's just one example. You can act yourself into thinking differently. You can't think yourself into acting differently. You can act yourself into thinking differently, but you can't think yourself into acting differently yeah I like that it's good isn't it? yeah that's really good did you come up with that no that's oh, a 12 step yeah. trope a lot of these things are like things these are sort of the folk wisdom yeah. of the 12 step program that's great we're going to throw that up on a quote or a little meme or something that you won't see because it'll be on social media do you mind when you do do it saying Russell Brand <laughs> Russell Brand came up with that on his own in a room using nothing but his genius yes he said he didn't plagiarise it from a group of people We'll put that together. Yeah, we'll put that whole thing in a parenthetical. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah good. that'll work. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you ever think, all right, I've got a baby daughter. Oh, crap. I've slept with a lot of women. This is what men are like. Maybe I should. Does that ever worry you? Or are you just kind of like, look, I... Not like yet, on one level, because I sort of see it, like, maybe, you know, talk to me again when she's 16, but like, yeah. no, oh, hopefully 25, but, but, but <laughs> like, sure. you should be so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> but like, what I'm thinking is, I don't, see, like, what I feel is, I don't know what type of a woman she is going to be, and That's I do, true. sort of, the other sort of thing is, I'm going to teach her, I hope, if she's up for it, right. like, to not do stuff to make her feel good just for the sake of it, to be a grounded, connected person. And the only way I can do that is by being grounded and connected around her. Now, I know all parents go into parenthood with those objectives and all sorts of curveballs must come flying in from every direction. But my hope is, is that by being conscious and awake around her, she won't go, oh, I'll feel great if I drink a lot and if I sleep with a load of 
painful. I'll be yeah. able to try that, and it does work temporarily, but here's some boring stuff. Right. Would you like to try this green juice, <laughs> yeah. label? You'll find it infinitely more satisfying. <laughs> yeah, it could be tough, especially with a teenager. I know, it could be extremely tough. Well, you know the score about neurology and biochemistry that she won't even have the mental facility, it literally doesn't arrive till the mid-twenties to understand certain aspects of reason I was listening to. So. She will, however, have the mental facility to tell you that you don't know anything, you don't understand, and you never could understand. And then she's going to read this book and probably curl up, oh, with any luck for you, curl up in a little ball and go to sleep and realize <laughs> that she dodged a bullet, right? I hope so. I hope so. You were on Colbert last night. Was that that was your first time on the show? Yeah. Yeah. How is this stuff for you now? I mean, th this aside, things like Colbert and going on uh, other shows that we can't name for legal reasons. <laughs> is that stuff still fun, or are you kind of like, all right, this is part of the job. I'm used to it by now. It is still fun if I do it right. Like Colbert, I recognize that something like this talking to you is like the reason I love this medium is it's sort of kind of oddly old-fashioned in a way. It's yeah. less constructed, it's a lot more room to unpack and examine ideas, it's more free-form, it's more intimate, it's more real. Something like going on Colbert is a performance, that's what I'm aware of, and I noticed while I was mm -hmm. doing it, I thought, oh god, I'm acting funny, you know, I'm pulling, like doing silly stuff with my legs, I'm leaning into him, I'm being antic and daft. Um, but I kind of like doing that, you know, it's a laugh to do that. Um, and then, like, maybe, and another thing is, I recognize my own snobbery because, like, going on to, like, um, say, daytime shows that are built around entertainment, I sort of think, well, I'm, I read very deep scriptural texts, I analyze Nietzsche, I don't think that these people are going to understand me. But I go on, and I realize that I'm from that background. I like whether you, you know, whether it's sure. entertainment or growing up watching that stuff. And these people are just people like me they're interested in the same things I'm yeah. interested in and funny enough a few of those shows that I've been on I've, ha I've been uh, given a little bit of a wake up because they're like they've been sort of like oh my cousin's a drug addict or like, like my relationship's codependent they've spoken in a very plain way and I've been like oh brilliant well this is what this is about so it's been actually you know that cuts adolescent idea of oh man the system this is all bullshit I don't see things like that no more. I sort of believe that I, one of the things that I maintain, and that's a continuum of the, the last book I wrote, was a revolution, and it was all about like changing systems and anarchism and right. deception in the media and sort of my understanding of Noam Chomsky and like learning and trying to um, distill important academic information into an accessible format. One of the things that continues is I think I'm optimistic about people. I think people are beautiful and that people will change. Um, so I don't, when I'm going on populist TV, I don't think, oh, I'm too good for this. I sort of think, no, these are beautiful humans. This is going to be brilliant. And, and they're looking to you both to be entertained and for you to make them think. Or do you think people are looking at you to you to be entertained and then you're kind of like, let me slide some entertainment in there and then uh, here's something that's much more important. I try and do both of those things. Like, I, because I think that's a nice way to learn. When I'm listening to people giving me spiritual information and advice, I love the theoretical stuff, but when people tell me a story about I did this and this is how it felt, I, I, I like it, you know? And when people tell me stuff that's funny, it really impacts me. So being put in the conditions where I have to be entertaining is not a drag, it's like a kind of joy. As long as I look after myself, if I'm overtired, then I can be a bit, I don't know, like, oh, God, I'm doing this bullshit. Yeah, I wondered if that was going to happen today. I was like, maybe we should just do a really short one because he might be really tired. No, it's been a joy, it's a joy to talk about it and it's a context in which I feel comfortable. You're obviously a very intelligent person and you're obviously tuned into what's real and challenging yourself and willing to be open. I've been watching you and your eye contact and I, you're obviously going through things yourself in life and it's sort of lovely to be able to communicate with another person. You know? Well, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate you, and I appreciate this. I wish I'd had this before today, because I would have read the whole thing and then pulled out even more. But that just means that you have to come back at some point. What I'm is to. what is next for you, by the way? Do you know yet? I mean, you have to promote this, so we'll, we'll make sure we do that. But I am curious. Do not stand up. I'll probably come back to this country, uh, America, and do stand up soon. Uh, I may do some acting. I sometimes read mm -hmm. a film script and think I'd like to do that. Um, what else will I do? I don't know. This is a weird time in my life. I've sort of always used to know. I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this. Yeah. Now I don't really know, but I 
feel all right about it. By the way, the back of my head is in your comedy special at the Improv from about four years ago. Oh, wow, yeah, cool. Right in the middle, too, and I thought, oh, man, we had to do this thing because we were in those first rows where they're like, you got to sign a waiver because if you turn around this way, You're in. your face is in there, maybe. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm it was cool. Okay. Did you like it? I did like it. I went with a group of, you know, it was interesting because I went with a group of people that I had decided, they had done some pretty shady stuff to me years and years ago. Oh. And they called and they said, will you come and go to this Russell Brand thing with us? And I said, no, because you guys did all this stuff that was really <laughs> shitty. And they said, actually, that's why we're inviting you, because we all want to apologize, and we all want to make up and take you out to dinner, and we would love for you to come to this comedy thing with us and end the night on this feel-good note. And that's exactly what happened. Oh, my God, I was a tool for reconciliation. You were, absolutely. Excellent. So thank you very much for everything. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you. We started with bees, we ended with connection. That's right. Brilliant. Bang. All right. And, we, and it's two minutes before we, we're going to get kicked out anyway, probably.